Hello, everybody. <laughs> Good evening. Wow. <laughs> you say you're going to talk about alcohol before the holidays, and look what you get. This is insane. I, I've been doing this for uh, almost 10 years, and I don't think I've ever had to go and beg chairs from the back room before. That's how popular this talk is. I'm very, very excited. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you for your flexibility as people you don't know settle in next to you and kind of share your table and that kind of thing. Much appreciated. Um, so my name is Jill Walshaw. I teach in the Department of History at the University of Victoria. Many of you know me. Um, this is our last talk uh, for 2023. We'll be starting up again in February with Dr. David Zimmerman. We'll be talking about the history of technology. Uh, following uh, in March, Rachel Cleese will be talking about the history of food and in April, history of sports in the Olympics with Christina Bonsawin. So three more talks going February, March, and April. You'll get an email with the link to book. And please do reserve a seat um, so that we know what we're doing for fire regulations. That would be great. Um, you'll get those a couple of weeks before each talk. Tonight, it is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague who's 
shyly sitting behind me here, uh, Dr. Georgia Sitara. Georgia got her PhD in 2007 from the University of Victoria, but she actually grew up and, um, and uh, did her first schooling in Montreal. Um, she's a historian of Canada by training. Uh, some of her earliest work looked at the connection between, follow me here, the rise of anti-cruelty to animals with the disappearance of buffalo herds. Okay, so that was her PhD research. But Georgia is very skilled at connecting issues of present day concern with our country's history. So for example, in that work I just described on the buffalo herds and its connection to animal rights, Georgia also found a connection between that animal rights movement and the rise of child protection measures. So always bringing it into context to understand our society better. Um, she keeps doing that in her research and her teaching. She works on race, racism, anti-racism. She works on colonialism and what decolonization means. Uh, she works on sexuality, very popular with the students. Um, she works on children and youth and questions of age in history. Um, Animal rights, social justice, still part of what she does. She teaches a number of popular classes, and she's in fact an award-winning teacher at the University of Victoria. Uh, <laughs> So just a few topic titles, uh, Gender, Power and Difference, that's a first year course, Race, Racism and Ethnicity in Canada, and History of Sexuality, that was actually our backup topic for tonight. It was either alcohol or sex, we couldn't quite decide, we decided, you know, maybe we'll go with alcohol. Um, she doesn't actually, <laughs> interestingly, she doesn't teach an entire course on alcohol at the university. Apparently it's okay for us to encourage students to talk about sex but not to talk about drinking. So, who knows. Maybe that's something you'll do after giving this talk, right? A course on alcohol? Uh, you know, it was, uh, it was offered. Oh, it was. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. oh, okay. Okay. We'll try to offer it again. Anyway, um, please give a warm welcome to Georgia Satara. I want to begin by acknowledging that we are on the territories of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. Tonight's history is a European Canadian settler colonial history taking place on indigenous territories, the lands we now call Canada. Alcohol is woven into a settler cultural and social life and its settlers and their practices. Both in the past and in the present and it's settlers who are going to be centered in the history that we're talking about tonight. Indigenous peoples were prohibited alcohol by Canadian law from 1876 to 1985. Alcohol was always available, but liquor restrictions defined citizenship, racial status, and inferiorized indigenous peoples much more effectively than the law stopped drinking, according to historian Robert Campbell. Historians Scott Thompson and Gary Ginesco argue that the state legislation made liquor a white or settler right. So it may not be apparent, but the history of booze can help us understand how power works. I also want to remember Dr. Sean Cafferkey, military historian of the Canadian Navy, who taught a course called Drink and Social Control in Canada at UVic. He suddenly passed away in 2008, and I was asked to step into his fully enrolled course all those years ago and the rest, as they say, is history. I also want to remember Greg Evans, historian of local brewing, who always generously shared his knowledge and passion with my students. I hope they are both here with us tonight in spirit. Let's raise a glass to them this evening. Sean and Greg, your work and legacies live on gone but not forgotten, but always loved. Thank you so much. My name is Dr. Georgia Satara. I teach in 
at UVic in the History Department and in Gender Studies, and I am blessed to call the History Department home. I'm honored to be part of Café Historique. Thank you so much for coming. I'm happy to share my PowerPoint, which includes book covers and some of the material that I'll talk about in my talk tonight. Thank you so much. There will be time for questions at the end, but if there isn't enough oxygen going to my brain for a lucid answer, please email me. No doubt, I think I will come up to perfect responses to your questions in the days to come. Oops. Oh. So I've tried to put everything and the kitchen sink in this lecture. So I've spent the last five days distilling. Ta -da -da. Okay. Uh, We'll do a whirlwind tour of shifting history of public drinking in Canada, from taverns and saloons to beer parlors and cocktail bars. We'll explore the rise of the temperance movement and its call from moderation to calling for prohibition, which was enacted in the context of World War I, and then the slow repeal of that legislation and the return to public drinking in the post-war years. The first part of my lecture explores a history of a world we have lost. Other components map the history of the present, the historical processes by which current practices were established and normalized. In many ways, I hope you'll find it a history full of surprises. I hope you'll enjoy it. So 200 years of history, 45 minutes, it's ambitious, let's get started. <laughs> So alcohol was ubiquitous in settler colonial life in the 18th and 19th centuries. It was considered safer to drink than water in Europe and became known as the elixir or water of life. Alcohol was believed to have medicinal qualities to be restorative and nutritious, a source of energy and calories for laborers, sailors, and farmers. Historian Cheryl Krasnick goes so far as to claim that Canada was built on Jamaican rum. James Morira in his history of the maritime provinces bears this out. He claims that the colonial government provided an allowance of three and a quarter gallons of rum per settler at the founding of Halifax in 1749 on Mi'kmaq territory. Rum, he writes, was a fundamental part of everyday existence. Another historian writing about the seaport town of Liverpool, Nova Scotia, tells us that loggers and sawmill workers accepted rum as payment to make up for the privations and hardships they endured in the first half of the 19th century. Laborers also drank booze during their work breaks at 11 a.m. and 4 o'clock. By the 1840s, drinks Drinking would be banned from the workplace and relegated to after-work consumption. And here, historian Craig Heron suggests that the practice continued illicitly as this 19, 1894 picture from uh, Tavistock, Ontario attests. So they're building and they're having a drink. And in this case, the booze was supplied by their employer. The Army and Navy, in the Army and Navy, alcohol was measured and dispensed officially as part of the soldiers and sailors' daily ration. In 1759, when the British defeated the French in North America, soldiers in the British Army were issued two quarts, eight cups of beer for each man, um, each day. And there's General Wolfe dying on the Plains of Abraham. He's not drunk. Um, <laughs> and after the British capture, of Jamaica in 1655, rum was introduced to the British Navy. Rum rations became grog in the 1740s when water was added to rum. Grog was served during the two main meals of the day, dinner at, no dinner and at, uh, at, dinner at noon and at supper, um, five ounces at each meal. And by the end of the 19th century, the daily ration was, or ration was reduced to 2.5 ounces, and this practice was only ended in March of 1972. What do you think about that? <laughs> so the tavern was the most important social structure of early settler life. Before the construction of railroads in the 1840s in Upper Canada, the lands now known as Ontario, 
Settlers traveled by horse and horse and carriage. Taverns were built every few miles to provide food and lodging for humans and food and water for horses. Taverns were all-purpose community centers and meeting places. They hosted town, political, and militia meetings, coroner's inquests, court sessions, plays, circuses, and church services before churches were built. And in taverns, alcoholic beverages were available at all times of the day, seven days a week, either to take home or to drink on the premises. Brandy, whiskey, rum, grog, beer, cider, wine, a house punch, although not cheap, were affordable. Tavern keepers were entrepreneurs. Taverns were run by families, including widows, who were granted licenses as a social welfare measure. Fascinating, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, taverns were popular. Thank you. They were places to catch up on news, to gossip, listen to traveler stories, or someone reading from the newspaper. They were places to sing and dance, play cards and billiards. Research by historian Julia Roberts suggests that upper Canadian taverns were inclusive venues in terms of gender and race, where experiences ranged across the spectrum of the human condition. Oh, and that bottom image is uh, Montgomery's Tavern in 1837, where they tried to have their Canadian Republican moment, and it failed. <laughs> uh, booze fueled the building of settlements. In Upper Canada, bees brought neighbors together to do work that required many hands, barn raising, building a house, and land clearing. The person who organized the bee was expected to supply plenty of whiskey to induce neighbors to attend. A minimum of one gallon of whiskey per attending family or an unlimited supply. As a result, as you may imagine, there were many deaths caused by drunken falls. <laughs> when raising the homes of ministers, settlers brought their own supplies. And Sean Cafferkey suggests that this is where BYOB, bring your own booze, originates. <laughs> Historian Greg Marquis persuasively argues, I love that, um, that most drinking actually took place in the home. Women brewed beer and made all kinds of delicious libations from fruit, vegetables, grains, and berries. Recall Anne of Green Gables' friend Diana getting sloshed on Mar Marilla's raspberry cordial. Uh, grocery stores, too, sold alcohol and allowed drinking for a penny a glass or five cents a grunt, what you could swallow in one breath. Um, when 1837 licensing forbade the selling of alcohol in these shops, shopkeepers gave it away with the purchase, according to Ann Jameson in her book, Winter Studies and Summer Rambles. In the, 19th, in the late 19th century, Montreal grocery stores were places where women were working class women's places of recreation, with the added bonus that the cost of the drink could be absorbed in the grocery bill, often bought on credit. And of course, alcohol wasn't just a carrier for other medicines. Alcohol was a form of medicine. It was used as a remedy for physical and psychological ailments. Alcoholic cures included homemade and commercially produced beer, cider, wine, distilled liquor, rum, and rye. And at the Toronto Hospital for the Insane, rather than as a cure, physicians used alcohol to make excited patients more manageable. The hospital's daily routine consisted of a small amount of alcohol, usually whiskey, distributed to inmates. In the 19th century, alcohol was given to all able-bodied patients who, unless they were paying inmates, inmates, unless they were paying inmates, they worked for their keep and were given exact amounts in the measure glass, usually during or after meals. So administering, administering medicine, food, and drink was part of the hospital's daily routine. Breathing might help. So, was the rise of the temperance movement a response to everyone drinking everywhere all the time? It's unlikely. First, beer and wine were not considered problematic drinks in the 19th century. Beer was brewed at home and was a household staple. Wine was included in the Christian sacrament. 
Drinking was commonplace among clergy and churchgoers of all Christian denominations until the 1830s, 1850s. And while the temperance literature named alcohol overconsumption as a social problem, business historians, I love business historians, who knew, who have examined the retail accounts of upper Canadian stores suggest that most people did not buy enough booze to support the claims of excessive drinking made in temperance literature. Oh, there's Bishop Strachan, and he would get mad at people if they spilled his wine. <laughs> oh, the fun things about history. So, Rather, historians suggest that the temperance movement was a response to a changing society, including mechanization, time discipline, and industrialization. The new capitalist economy required productivity, efficiency, work, and discipline. And in that context, alcohol became an explanation for social problems in a society transitioning to industrial capitalism. So rather than a defensive or backward-looking movement in trying to change people's drinking habits, which clearly was not successful, uh, <laughs> booze historian Craig Heron argues that temperance was, quote, the cutting edge of a cultural revolution, unquote, created by a new middle-class social order. The thing I would want to say is that no matter what the aims were of the leadership, diverse groups came to, came to temperance for their own ends. It's fascinating to me also that in the first half of the 19th century, the temperance movement was, yes, you guessed it, a male-dominated movement led by men of political and financial influence while other men made their fortunes in the liquor trade. So the temperance movement was part of the making of the middle class self. It advanced a new concept of the individual which required self-control and self-improvement, a new construction of manhood, which also reflected changing ideas of marriage and the rise of a companionate ideal. If drinking made husbands brutes, temperance sought to eliminate animalistic behavior in men. Drunkenness associ was associated with working class drinkers who came to be seen as animalistic. And this lack of control was thought to lead to criminality and a descent into savagery. So temperance literature proposed that abstaining would lead to worldly and having heavenly success, respectability, material comfort, steady employment, and habits of industry. Men would no longer rule by, by force, but through a symbolic authority. The new masculinity required not brute strength, but self-control. The 19th century temperance movement challenged the practice of conjugal violence, and it would take another full century, only in the 1970s, through feminist activism for the dominant society to rediscover the issue of family violence. It's ironic that the changing organization of daily life may have led to problem drinking. Folks went to from drinking little amounts throughout the day, which may have produced some tolerance, whereas concentrating drinking during leisure may, may have increased drunkenness. For instance, once merchant marines became dry, some sailors may have binged between voyages. In addition, historians argue that temperance did not consider the pressures of economic uncertainty. Changes in social organization may have produced anxieties that alcohol relieved. A historian, J Jerome Nettlehaft, argues, male temperance literature was concerned with the consequences of alcohol, not with alcohol as a consequence. So not the consequences of alcohol, but with alcohol as a consequence. So, as historian of working class families in the late 19th century Montreal, Bettina Bradbury argues this, that it would be a mistake to see alcohol as a problem. The drinking could be a reaction to unemployment. Drinking could pose as much of a threat to family survival as unemployment and low wages. But then working class women supplemented their family income selling liquor by the glass illegally. So the history of working class people's relationship with alcohol was layered and complex. So we can interpret the temperance movement as a modern use of alcohol. 
Did you notice the, the room kind of changed the vibe when we were talking temperance? <laughs> so a modern use of alcohol. Cold water society, called cold water societies because of their tendency to advocate for water to replace alcohol, the temperance movement worked to create alcohol-free zones. They aimed to take over the functions of the tavern by dry soirees, sports teams, libraries, reading rooms, social events without drinking. So when you next go out for a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, know that, know that the temperance movement had something to do with it. The temperance movement was successful in Atlantic Canada, first by getting farmers to agree not to pay workers in rum. In the 1820s, they asked Canadians to take moderation pledges to abstain from hard liquor. This one that I have up here is from uh, the, early the early 20th century, so it's asking for people to abstain from malts uh, as well as wine. In the early part of the century, it was just hard liquor. And then by the 1840s, it became clear that people took the pledge enthusiastically, but they didn't always have enduring results. Even John A. MacDonald took the pledge, according to his biographer, uh, the biography, The Man Who Made Us. And it's public knowledge. We all know that he went, to, to, he went on to be drunk in the House of Commons for decades to come. So, <laughs> in fact, when the maritime colonies, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island, held a conference in Charlottetown in 1864, the Canadians, that is settlers from Quebec and Ontario, crashed that conference with $13,000 worth of champagne, 8,600 bottles, and they swayed the Maritimers away from Maritime Union toward Confederation. <laughs> so booze helped to make Canada. Nonetheless, starting in the 1850s, the temperance movement shifted its strategy from moral persuasion to prohibition. And in the next few decades, various pieces of legislation were put into place, making it possible for municipalities to have referendums on the question of banning drink in their communities. So, and temperance was successful everywhere except large cities. The Scott or the Canada Temperance Act of 1878 required only a quarter of the electors of a town or county to demand a vote through secret ballot for prohibiting the retail sale, but not production of alcoholic beverages within a municipality, except for medicinal, sacramental, and mechanical purposes. So a successful wo vote generally closed drinking establishment. But so consumption at liquor, of liquor at home in private dwellings was perfectly legal, just bars, taverns, and public drinking was illegal. And licensed distillers and brewers could sell out of province. Local victories could be overturned by another vote, and it created a patchwork of wet and dry areas. And alcohol was transported from wet areas to, and sold in dry ones. And you could get alcohol legally by mail order, um, I love that, uh, to private households, and of course, illegally sold in unlicensed she bins or what they call blind pigs. And I just did a cool, quick Google search about the etymology of the blind pig. Apparently, so this farmer sold tickets uh, for people to come and see his blind pig, uh, and he gave away booze because. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, you could, it was illegal to sell booze, but not to sell tickets for people to come and see your blind pig. <laughs> One of the outcomes of the Scott Act or the Temperance Act was the spatial reorganization of drinking. And I think to some extent, we still live with that. Taverns became confined to city centers. These divided commercial and residential areas and good and bad neighborhoods. But late into the 19th century and early 20th centuries, taverns, or saloons as they would be called in the West, remained important venues for working class men. Working class men and their historians argue that the well-to-do drank in their spacious and comfortable homes and private clubs, but for working men, their principal recreation was socializing in a tavern. Taverns helped define working class masculinity and bonds between men. The custom of treating 
In tavern culture, buying rounds of liquor for all the men present obliged those being treated to reciprocate at a later time. Treating fostered bonds of care, solidarity, community, and reciprocity. I wish we had a time machine. The temperance attack on the tavern, what was that? The temperance attack on the tavern and treating was seen as an attack on working class men's freedom to practice what they saw as masculinity, as an affront to their liberty, the freedom to choose and to do as they pleased. For temperance, a man who drank renounced his freedom. Temperance offered men greater freedom, Dries argued, a chance to become prosperous and moral, what historian Matthew Sambuler considered an effort to construct a different set of patriarchal relations. But these were different values and competing understandings of freedom. In any case, the tavern was difficult to supplant. Other recreations were less of an alternative, but more complementary to the tavern. So these are really fun. You can see there's platoons, there's a railing, a foot railing at the bottom, and you could approach the bar, and the bars were quite beautiful in terms of their paneling. And then the war changed everything. It was only in the context of the First World War that the temperance movement won its substantive victory when Prime Minister Robert Borden, through the War Measures Act of 1917, imposed a countrywide prohibition. Why? Concern over immigrants, that it was unpatriotic to drink, and all of a sudden, Canada, alcohol in Canada was cast as un-Canadian. It also helped to save grain and other resources for the war effort. So the federal government shut down the retail trade in liquor, but its manufacture was legal. Um, reduced to alcohol content of 0.1.5 or 2.5 maximum percent, near beer was available for sale. Legal possession of alcohol in your home was allowed. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> I know no one who came here tonight to hear a talk about constitutional history, so I'll only say that the courts decided that both the federal and the provincial governments shared a responsibility to regulate alcohol. The provinces had power to act within their borders, including alcohol retail, and the federal government had control over manufacturing and interprovincial trade. So prohibition in Canada has a national history and each province has its own history. And for more information, please invite me to give another lecture. <laughs> so the question that we have tonight is how did prohibition affect everyday drinking? Did Canadians stop imbibing? No. Valverde, Mariana Valverde, uh, argues that Canada was hardly wet. But perhaps other historians have, would have said it was a little moist. So we begin with James Gray in his 1972 book, Booze, uh, History of uh, Drinking on the Prairie Provinces, and he puts it in the following way. There was enough loopholes, there were enough loopholes left to enable a determined drunk to drink without pause. Breweries operated under federal charter. He says drinkers became waterlogged rather than intoxicated with near beer, but regular beer was available to known customers just under the bar. And as police worked in pairs, he writes, quote, only a hungry bootlegger or a village idiot would sell a bottle of booze to a couple of strangers, unquote. <laughs> Douglas Hamilton, in his book Sobering Dilemma, A History of Prohibition in BC, tells us that it was legal to make and drink liquor in your own dwelling, but this is fascinating, not every dwelling counted. So boarding houses, bunk houses, tents, cabins, float houses, all excluded. Alcohol was also available by prescription. <laughs> it cost the prescription itself cost two to four dollars in doctors, vets' offices, and dentists. And then you would take that prescription and get it filled at a pharmacy. So, <laughs> doctor, have a cough. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hamilton argues that both facts created class and race-based legislation that criminalized the 
the working class favorite beverage, their full strength beer, it criminalized the poor and non-white people. Like in all other provinces, alcohol was available through mail order. This is a, an incredible example. This is from Ontario. So Ontario legislation made it, made selling beer within the province illegal. But brewing beer was not illegal. And you could buy beer for ma by mail order. So an Ontario customer placed an order for beer with a merchant in Ontario or the US and enclosed a payment. The merchant forwarded the order to the brewery and sent the customer the receipt. Then the customer would show the prepaid order at the brewery and pick up the beer or have their order shipped. The most important part was this out of province receipt. So although Canada was legally dry, the trenches were not. Military historian Tim Cook describes rum as, quote, more a medicine than a beverage in the First World War. He says, rum was a combat motivator, a reward, a, a medicine, and liquid courage. In the grim reality of trench warfare, rum, one soldier explained, quote, helped to take the taste of dead men out of my mouth, unquote. Temperance men who entered the army came to reconsider rum's value at the front. Cook puts it in the following way. Demon rum was the soldier's tool, and without it, the common men who made up the soldier's profession, bankers, clerks, farmers, who put down their pens and plows for rifles, might have collapsed under the terrible strain, both physical and psychological, of trench warfare. He says the ration was small enough not to make soldiers exceedingly drunk, although there was a concern about giving soldiers rum just before they went over the top. And it would be veterans and women's voters who would help repeal prohibition in the 1920s. Any craft beer lovers in the house? You might be interested to know that one of the most devastating impacts on alcohol or the casualties of prohibition was actually on the Canadian brewing industry, which was reduced by 42%. It went from 118 to 69 plants, and then it led to consolidation of major labels and the loss of many, many small, important local breweries. And we've actually only been seeing the resurgence of the craft beer industry in the last 20 or 30 years. Fascinating, right? I thought so too. So prohibition turned millions of people into lawbreakers. In fact, in British Columbia, the BC Prohibition Commissioner appointed in September of 1917, Walter Chester Finley, who got the job because who better to enforce the law than the Secretary of the People's Prohibition Movement, was caught the following year illegally importing 700 cases of whiskey, 8,400 bottles, with the intent to sell for personal profit. He was convicted and spent two years in jail. Not only did Canadians not stop drinking, prohibition made drinking fashionable and more expensive, and because it was illegal, the state could not profit from its sales. In the fall of 1919, the federal prohibition ended in Canada, and most provinces except Quebec continued for a time. And over the course of the 1920s, there would be a renewed call for moderation rather than prohibition without the return of the saloon. We tried to make it not be blurry, but it insisted. <laughs> so again, each province has its own history, but in general, except for, for Quebec, where drinks were available in hotels, taverns, cafes, clubs, corner stores, and grocery stores, most provinces opened government liquor stores first, and then sometime uh, years later, licensed drinking establishments. So I don't know where, how to do the pointer, but in that corner, you could see when provinces went dry, when they opened stores, and then when they returned to public drinking. So BC was the second province to dismantle prohibition in 1920 through a vote, which authorized the opening of government-owned liquor stores. Most provinces had a Liquor Control Act and a Liquor Control Board, which among other things, issued licenses called permits to drink. 
In BC, permits could cost up to a day's wages in the 1920s. Retail store prices were high. Customers could not touch the products or even see them before they purchased them. You'd have to go in, fill out an order form, pay in advance, and the vendor would retrieve the item from the back. A store vendor also had the authority to limit what a person could buy. Scott Thompson and Gary Ganesco's study, Punch Drunk of Ontario's 1927 law, explains that the Ontario Liquor Board worked from the premise that individual moderation and strict liquor control would better protect the population than prohibition. So it allowed some individuals to drink and the government to draw huge profits. So the new rationale, I'm so glad you like it, the new rationale was that the alcohol didn't lead necessarily to bad outcomes, those were the result of overindulgence. So, ta -da -da, moderation became a form of harm reduction as a way to control the harms of alcohol use. So, we could think about liquor control as a temperance project continued in another way. Isn't that clever? That's uh, Ganesco and Thompson. So, liquor control as a temperance project continued in another way. To that end, the Liquor Control Act made buying alcohol a very bureaucratic process. So you needed your permit, which was like a driver's license, except it was, gave you a, a license to be able to purchase alcohol. It was also a way that the government kept track of your purchases and could stop you if they thought you were purchasing too much. So you had to fill out a form with the sale, the date, the type of liquor, the name, the address, and the permit number of the buyer, and the name and the number of the store as well as the employee. And that system lasted till the 1970s. Uh, it, meant, it was meant to stimulate temperance training. And if you drank too much, you could get put on an interdiction list. That means they would send you a letter, and then they would put your name on a list, and that list would go to all liquor vendors and to the police, and it would prohibit you from further alcohol purchases. So first we have these forbidding liquor stores, not the shiny, shiny, fancy, shiny stops we have today, and then very slowly over time, da -da -da, the return to public drinking. So in 1920, in, in British Columbia in 1924, a plebiscite was held on the question of beer by the glass. Victoria opposed. Vancouver beer parlors opened their doors in 1925, and Victoria got its first beer parlor in 1954. Wow. wow. Robert Campbell argues that while temperance groups lost the battle over the return to public drinking, the movement was successful in branding the saloon as immoral, which changed the bar in the post-war era. And I have this, we could see the changes over time, we'll talk about them in a moment. So in his amazing book, Sit Down and Drink Your Beer, Campbell describes beer parlors as rigidly structured drinking environments. The stand-up bar was banished. The spittoon and foot rail gone. Patrons were required to sit at small tables, which seated four, to prevent treating everyone in the bar. No singing or entertainment was allowed. You needed to be seated to be served. Standing while drinking was forbidden. <laughs> All beer parlors had a bar, but patrons were not permitted to approach it. <laughs> and patrons could not take a glass of beer from one table to another. If you wanted to move, you'd have to get a server to move your beer for you. And no food was available, nor soft drinks, Draft beer and some bottled beer was available, and this is why he calls his book, Sit Down and Drink Your Beer. And at first, women were barred from entry. As early as 1910, BC banned women from public drinking establishments, blaming women for the spread of venereal disease, or what the young people now call sexually transmitted infections. To mitigate the concern in 1927, when women were allowed in Vancouver parlors, they were relegated into a separate room or partitioned into a specific section for women and male escorts. Sometimes women had their own designated entrance. This is the third image. Uh, and those, those partitions were only removed in 1963. And Campbell says that it was the focus was on policing heterosociability rather than homosexuality. 
unless men try to have sex in the washrooms. He says, officials regulated women more than men. The regulatory priority, he says, was the suppression of illicit heterosexuality, to police the sexual and regulate women's sexuality. So Campbell tells us, I find this fascinating, that men of color drank in parlors without incident unless they were in the company of white women. That practice was challenged by state authorities, parlor operatives, and other customers who saw men of color with white women as a threat to the dominance of white men and for destabilizing the category white. So a mixed race couple referred to a white woman and a man of color, not a woman of color and a white man. Fascinating, right? And Campbell says that all of it was governed by appearance and behavior, not by identity or even identity cards. And a lot of it was actually policed by beer parlor patrons. And in this way, okay, theory, are you ready? Campbell argues that the state works through us. So we have that legislation, but in fact, it takes all of us all the time to actually enact it. And then only in 1953 did BC allow for licensed restaurants, cabarets, local cocktail lounges, in addition to hotels. The government wanted to make money for big projects, highways, dams, and bridges, and, out, and liquor sales actually brought in the cash. As early as 1930s, liquor sales made up 23% of the government's income. And some historians suggest that the state was addicted to the revenue from booze sales. <laughs> Manitoba, let's go, anybody from Manitoba in the house? Yeah, babies, representing. Uh, so Manitoba ended prohibition in 1923, first with the sale of liquor in government stores, then beer by the glass in parlors by 28, and then 30 years later in 1957, um, the cocktail lounge. So how do we make sense of these developments? Histor historian Dale Barber explains that people were ignoring the law. They were drinking together at dances, at supper clubs, and at socials by quote unquote drinking under the table. In public establishments, the management served the mixer and patrons brought in their own bottles. So alcohol was already part of the heterosocial space in the early 1950s. So in 1957, the law allowed for mixed drinking, which in this case was both mixed cocktails and the mixing of gendered bodies in the same social space. Wow, right? 57. Um, the law changed to conform to practice. What Barber says is that enforcement was only possible when people, when the law was approved by the people. As a result, when we have these new drinking places opening their doors, people had already been drinking. Beginning in 1957 in Manitoba, it became legal and open. So any Vancouverites in the house? In 1968, the Vancouver's Penthouse Nightclub, a very famous nightclub, got its liquor license, so 1968. But the tables had hideaway drawers where bottles could be stashed in case of police raids <laughs> since 1947. <laughs> and then in the 1970s in BC, there was a lowering of the drinking age to 19, liquor licensing for outdoor cafes, cruise ships, the loosening of constraints in beer parlors, finally allowing entertainment and drinking while standing. <laughs> I want to end on a sober note. <laughs> so what about the question then of problem drinking, which seemed to have sparked the temperance movement in the first place? And I'm sure when I was telling you about all the paces people were drinking, you were like, yeah, it was right that they should stop. <laughs> so where are we now? In the 18th century, drunkenness came to be considered as a sin. And then in the 19th century, we only had a handful of doctors, just a handful who said, hey, maybe this might lead to what we call an addiction in the 20th century, this heavy drinking uh, as habitual drunkenness as a problem that is addiction. 
although they didn't call it that, inebriety would have been their language. And then we had another doctor who made a claim in the 19th century, maybe drinking does lead to various illnesses, but those ideas don't take off. It's gonna actually take 100 years into the second half of the 20th century for those ideas to take hold. Alcoholism replaced inebriety in medical and everyday speech in the 1920s and 1930s. Alcohol studies, alcoholology, I, try to, I dare you to say that five times fast, alcoholology uh, in the US in 1939 was initially funded by the liquor industry and they argued that alcohol itself was not the problem. Alcoholism was blamed on the man, not the bottle. So a very big transformation from the 19th century that is now, it's not the bottle, it's the man. So rather than science or the medical establishment, the most important innovation for the well-being of alcoholics was the creation of AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, in the US in 1935 by Bill Wilson, a New York stockbroker, and Robert Smith, an Akron doctor, both with serious self-diagnosed drinking problems. They, de yeah, self-diagnosed. Uh, they developed a program to help alcoholics stay sober. They published a big book uh, in 1939 and subsequently the 12 steps. And for them, the problem was not alcohol, but a minority of drinkers, not a question of sin or the availability of booze. So for AA, alcoholism is a non-medical disease. Alcoholism cannot be defined by alcohol consumed or specific clinical criteria. It's a sub subjective experience, only the individual knows. So AA cast health professionals in a supporting role. AA was based on mutual help with other alcoholics based on shared experience. And they created weekly meetings to foster a new community of like-minded people as a substitute for life, for a social life and drinking venues. The ultimate goal was to help people achieve inner peace. Sobriety was defined not by an absence of drinking, but by a positive state of existence. And I just want to make the link here to Don Nickel, who also used to teach in the history department at UVic, and now runs a women's recovery program called She, Retire, she Recovers, She Retires. <laughs> she retired from drinking, and now runs She Recovers, and there is a copy, there's a, the cover of her, of her newest book, you should know that Elvin M. Jelinek, named, nicknamed Bunky, uh, worked for the World Health Organization and he advanced a disease concept of alcoholism and he defined it as an illness with a use of any alcoholic beverages that causes damage to the individual, society, or both. And his antidote was aversion therapy using antabuse and prefrontal lobotomies. <laughs> and then in the 1960s, the World Health Organization called alcohol North America's greatest dependency problem. According to Greg Marquis, he says that alcohol was reclassified as a drug because alcohol is socially acceptable, it became known as a non-drug drug. He says that while other drugs were criminalized, North Americans made peace, he says, with alcohol through regulation, treatment, and toleration, despite alcohol consumption being a top health threat. The 1969 Ladane Commission, a federal commission on the non-medical use of drugs, issued its final report in 1973 and concluded, quote, from every point of view, the effects of excessive alcohol use are more harmful than any of those of any form of non-medical drug use, unquote. But alcohol is so deeply embedded in Canadian culture that although it's very dangerous, it is legal. And as we have seen, its presence in everyday life is expanding. Do you see that? That we have this scientific literature for the first time, not temperance, but material coming out of science and medicine saying uh, drinking is dangerous, but we have its expansion in everyday life uh, and in the public at the same time. So, all to say that just because it's hard to know whether or not what is true. That's why I have this, my first thing was, you know, uh, 
you never hear what I, when I, what I have to say, yes, I'll have a beer, is because we have this discourses around drinking, but they don't necessarily match the reality of what's going on. So alcoholism might now be accepted as some kind of disease, but there's still a public assessment of it in moral terms, which cast al alcoholics as responsible for their own illness. And in this way, 19th century ideas continue in our own day. For Mariano Valverde, governance of alcohol is a way for us to understand how our consumption and our bodies are governed. I think it helps us to know ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So the question is, what about our distillers? How did they respond? What was their role? They play a very important role, and maybe we would have had temperance earlier had it not been for the fact that they made a lot of money for government, and that government was, oh, the great Canadian way, patronage. Um, that government was reliant on business, and business was reliant on government. So we could say that they held a lot of sway because there was a lot of money to be made, and government certainly didn't want to dissuade them from making money because government depended on that money. This is why distilling never became illegal. It was never closed down. Um, so we do have advocates of distilling in government, supporting government, and they're going to be the ones who are going to fund the industry to say that it's actually not booze itself, but uh, the problem drinker. So they're always there. Our, our distillers are there, and they're always advocating that they're, it's not their product that is the problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, what about the role of uh, Puritanism and all this? Uh, a Puritan is defined as a uh, person who lives in dread that someone somewhere is having fun. And right. these guys, they, they certainly were involved in the, in the prohibition movement. There's no doubt about right. that. So the question is, are Puritans, where are they? And are the people who dread other people having fun. Um, I don't know if the Canadian literature ever calls them Puritans. Um, they might be evangelical Christians that might show up in that way in the literature. But evangelical Christians, they would never have said, I want to stop you from having fun. They would be more concerned about your well-being. Um, about, about your private health and what it might mean for public health and about the social well-being. So that's the way that they would frame it. Um, and they wanted to have fun. That's why they set up dances without booze and tea, and tea soirees and um, got people together for, oh, strawberry socials, didn't they, Lynn? <laughs> so they, it wasn't about stopping people from having fun, but creating other kinds of fun to replace what they saw as detrimental to the health of the individual and the, and the culture. Thank you. So, um, where does uh, restrictions to serving minors come into play oh, during I that timeline? <laughs> oh, 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 you make me so happy. Um, you know, because we all used to be kids. Do you remember? Uh, no. <laughs> so, uh, minors could always drink at home if their family provided the booze. If they were with their families, it was perfectly fine for a, a parent to give their child something to drink. And we know that working class youth were in Joe Beef's bar in the 1870s, 1880s. Joe Beef's was a canteen in uh, Montreal, and they had a hundred or so beds, 
and most of those beds were filled by 12 to 14 year olds. So youth were working and self-supporting and of course they are totally part of that culture. Um, probably by early 20th century, there's an attempt to stop youth from drinking. But let's say you're a 16 year old and you work, you're, you work um, in the woods. Let's say you, you cut wood for a living. Tell me what is the word for that that I'm looking for? Logging. Logger. Okay, so you come into town, <laughs> there's not enough oxygen. Uh, you come into town, you've been working in the woods, they're not gonna ask you for ID. It's not a world where people are asked for ID. So if you are self-sufficient, if you are working, if you are part of that culture, you would have access to alcohol. So I would say probably by early 20th century, they're gonna try to stop youth from coming into the bars. Um, that's what I would say, by early 20th century. But you know, in British Columbia, it's, youth continue to be self-supporting the concept of the teenager really only develops during the depression uh, because there's not enough work and for the first time we have lots of youth going into high school. Um, so it's, a, it's really interesting to think about uh, the policing and the changing ideas of youth. And part of it is this is a world that we have lost because our ideas of, who, of youth now are so different from what they were a um, 100 years ago. But I would say early 20th century, we have a shift to try to get those, to stop kids from coming into the bars. And one way that that was policed was that over the course of the 19th century, it made tavern keepers responsible. So if people came into your bar and they drank too much, you would become responsible. If they fought, you would become responsible. So that, could be, that was one way in which that was policed. But I bet male youth were probably in there, in the bars, m more than respectable women by early 20th century. Does that, is that interesting? I think that's interesting, that a working class youth would have more freedom than, uh, thank you, did I do well? <laughs> were you drinking when you were young? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you did. Bar, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when was that, if I may ask? Too long ago to remember. Yeah, I love that. Good answer. Early 70s. Early 70s. See, and that's the other thing is that the law can only tell us so much. The law can tell us what people, what was, we were supposed to be doing, but it doesn't tell us what people were actually doing. Because I bet you drank lots before they kicked you out that time. Just that. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. What is it, do you think, about sobriety? That no matter what we do, we require periodic understanding of alcohol. Beautiful. What do I think about sobriety that we require a periodic anesthetic of alcohol? So interesting. So Alcoholics Anonymous says once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. So for them, one drink might be too much. But maybe we could go back to those pressures of life. So maybe sometimes we just need a little bit of release. Maybe a little bit of relief. Maybe we just need to make the world feel a little bit better for just a little while. Maybe that could be a way of understanding why we could be sober and then it could be so hard to stay sober. But everything around us is about booze, isn't it? It's hard. It's hard to be sober. Don't you think? <laughs> what was that? Yay, team. Thank you. goodness. I think that that's so fascinating. Um, one thing I would say, if, if Barbara says people were already drinking alcohol in mixed venues, and that's why the law caught up, we could think about how Victoria was lit, and that's why the law caught up, because everybody was smoking. We have to change a law because otherwise it might lead to disrespect of the law if we have a law that says you shouldn't um, 
<laughs> you shouldn't smoke, and then everybody's smoking. But it's lucrative, isn't it? And the Ladain Commission that, that I talked about that issued its report, it was a commission that was talking about legalizing cannabis, in part because lots of middle class white youth were smoking, and they didn't want to put those youth in prison. Uh, and, and at that time, oh, oh, thank you. Oh. I, was, I was bellowing, but clearly not loud enough. Um, the Ladain Commission, I think they were trying to make an argument that cannabis should be decriminalized because so many people were using it, but it to took some 30 to 40 years to catch up. I do think that those dispensaries now are so fancy and shiny and glistening, and it's interesting to think about the liquor store in the 1920s being such a forbidding place in comparison to the shiny dispensaries today. Is that a useful answer? I think it's interesting to think about cannabis. Um, cannabis in Canada was only criminalized in 1923. Emily Mar Murphy thought that if you smoked, you would go insane. Um, so it's interesting to think that as alcohol was being decriminalized in the 1920s, cannabis actually came to be criminalized in the 1920s. I hope that was useful or interesting. Thank you. Email me. I'm sure I'll, in the days to come, I'll wake up and go, oh, that's a great answer. I should have given it. I'll be right back. Tell me your name. Uh, Matthew. Matthew, thanks. Um, I was thinking about with the taxes on Ooh. alcohol, considering it's about, I believe, 11%. Too much? It's a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, with, with the economic um, benefits of the taxation on alcohol, and I know in the last, I believe it was early 2021, the CBC put out an article talking about um, the Canada putting out a statement of the safe amount to drink per week, from five drinks per week down to two drinks per week. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what you think about the economic benefits that the government Okay, so the question is, how much money is the government going to lose if we go from drinking five to two <laughs> drinks? Um, so do people listen to the government? And do people listen to guidelines? I'm not sure. Um, I have to think about it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my hand into my gender studies uh, uh, backpack and think about performativity. Because the state, I mean, if the, if the literature is coming out and saying we shouldn't be um, drinking that much, that it is bad for us, and I think the literature is saying that, the state has to tell people. Because oh, smoking. In the early 20th century, there was a concern about people smoking. And the only people who they were able to police and legislate were youth on the grounds that we're going to protect you. But adults were saying, I don't want to eat and smoke and drink by acts of parliament. I should, as an adult, I should be able to make those kinds of choices. And we know that it took until the 1970s when we had class action suits against the cigarette companies that we actually have had a whole transformation around smoking. So part of that, I mean, cigarettes used to bring in a lot of money, but then it's became a toll on the other end, on the health system. So I think that it must be a balance around that. I read a, recently a um, philosopher from UBC, I want to call him Mark Kinswell, and he's going through his, he just had his second liver transplant. And he talked about the fact that he had been a drinker for a long time, and he makes, he asks, in the, at the end of it, it's published in the Globe and Mail, And then every day, reflections on the life of drinking in March of this year, I passed the second anniversary, the first anniversary of my second liver transplant, Mark Kinswell. And he makes an argument in this piece where he suggests that maybe alcohol will go the way of cigarettes. 
So I don't know how old you are. But when I was young, cigarettes were everywhere. We could smoke in, I went to Concordia, we could smoke in our classroom <laughs> when I was an undergrad. Um, and now, when you go in to buy a pack of cigarettes, they're so forbidding. They're disgusting, they're not pretty anymore. And he makes the claim, as somebody whose body is ravaged by drinking, that perhaps in the years to come, maybe alcohol will go the same way as the cigarette. Yes, thank you, was that a good answer? Hi, tell me your name. My name? Yeah. Vincent. Hi, Vincent. So the question is about alcohol and control. Oh, now we're gonna put on our hats, our intellectual hats, are you all ready? Uh, so when Sean Cafferkey developed the course, he called it a drink and social control because that was the language that was used by scholars at the time to say we had a state and it passed that legislation and it was trying to um, control people. And then in the 1980s, 1990s, scholars started to use the words moral regulation. I know, right? Thinking caps. Uh, and that was an idea that the state might, uh, first of all, we are all state actors. Aren't you some of you civil servants making policy? Exactly, exactly. Um, so there isn't really a divide between the public and the state because we vote for the government, people work for the government, and then that the state and policy might actually reflect, um, I guess, the, uh, the times and what people might need. On the, if we're gonna say, if we think about control in a different way, that is, is the attempt to control the population by getting everybody so stoned that they're not paying attention? Uh, it's possible. Um, and in fact, there are people who are straight edge, who actually, for a variety of reasons, for many different groups, who actually make the decision not to imbibe, not alcohol, not drugs, in order to be clear, in order to affect change. But, that language of control and regulation suggests that each individual is a historical agent and you make decisions about what might be best for you. And, and that because we're all human beings, um, we'll change our minds. I think that there was another question. Mira, you little love button. I taught Mira like 10 years ago. Hi. Uh, I have kind of a question. Ooh. I can't think of it. Can you email me in the days to come and maybe I'll figure it out? Thank you so much. I think there's another question. Thank you. Yeah, do you have any comment on how the sacraments and alcohol got tied together? What's a sacrament? Uh, that's that stuff you get on Sunday if you're good. Oh, the sacrament. <laughs> Lynn, do you know how the sacraments got together with alcohol? I know when the Catholic Church started using drinks. Right. Lynn Marks is a historian of religion and she doesn't know, and neither do I. <laughs> I love that. Mm -hmm. for uh, 
what's going on? I mean, do we have a percentage? Do 90% of them abuse alcohol? Do only 10% sit, sit back and enjoy it? You know, I don't know if we have statistics. Oh, the question is, do we know how many people abuse alcohol as opposed to people who just enjoy it uh, um, responsibly? Did I sound like a yeah. booze ad? Um, <laughs> I think that the problem with statistics is that the scholars say people always under-report. Yeah. Yeah. So it's hard to know because nobody, the whole world is so judgy. <laughs> so, so people may not actually be willing to tell the truth. I don't know if anybody's penalized yet, though, except for the high cost. I'll be back. Well, that's what I was just going to say. I don't think there's a penalty. It's really a luxury tax. It, it is a luxury it really was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not, it's because it's not a necessity, and so government needs to earn money somehow, right. and it's a way of sort of earning money on something that is not something that you need to survive. Mm -hmm. Although my son went to South Park School, and they didn't accept government funds because of the money came from alcohol. So we had to... And, and, really? and, well, we, and gambling. So we had to work together to try to get money for the new playground uh, because of that. John? Thank you. Yay, team. Um, I was going to say misogyny, but... <laughs> uh, you know, when I read Craig Heron, one of the boys, when I read him, He's an amazing historian. Um, he makes it sound like men wanted the bar to themselves, that it was as if it was a place in which there would be no women, that they could bond between themselves, that they didn't have to deal with all the responsibilities of, um, the, I guess we're all nagging. Um, <laughs> I don't nag, um, except to my students. Um, if I think about it, I, you know, I'm thinking about Judith Walkowitz right now, amazing historian of sexuality and prostitution in late 19th century England. And she makes this claim. She says that we had these, they passed these Contagious Diseases Acts um, that suggested that women were a source of venereal infection and if the police thought that you were, quote unquote, a common prostitute, um, they could stop you and take you in to see if you had an infection. And a lot of women actually got STIs from unsterilized medical equipment. So that's a very terrible story. But Walkowitz makes this argument that the Contagious Diseases Acts made it possible that any woman standing on a street corner with her friend, um, out at a bar, out at a pub, could be called a common prostitute, taken in and arrested. And she says that working class people used to have, um, she said, they, uh, they maintained a fine balance between coming in and out of sex work and respectability. So it's time to pay the rent, maybe do a little bit of sex work, um, and then be reintegrated into the communities. So once we have the sexual disease, uh, the venereal, mm, contagious, thank you, uh, there's the shift. So when I looked at um, Campbell before this talk, he makes this claim that in the, nine, in the First World War, there's all these um, men in the Canadian Expeditionary Force. They're being, um, I don't have enough oxygen. They're being tested, and they're found positive for STIs. And it's going to be women who are going to be criminalized as spreading disease. Um, in fact, I considered putting some of those ads on the the PowerPoint, but I changed my mind. I thought enough misogyny in the world, let's not <laughs> spread it around. Um, so that idea of women as a source of infection, that, that idea of respectability, that idea that 
in order to have some power in the world that you had to stay out of bars, otherwise you would lose respectability could have been one reason why women may not be there. But I always question this. Like, and that goes back to my first slide. Let's go back to it. Oh, look at me using the clicker, Zaki. <laughs> it's a miracle. Okay. Like this, when I, when, the reason why I chose that is I often think about historians, you know? So you never listen to me, you only hear what you want to hear. Sometimes I think about historians looking at the archival record. And who knows what's there? Who knows where women are at? Who knows what they're doing? And I wonder, do historians not see them because they don't expect to find them? Or worse, worse they don't even care. Um, so this is one of the things I think about a lot because I think about, um, who, who, you know, where were they? And maybe they were in the side room and maybe there were lots of them. And maybe Bedina Bradbury says they're at the grocery store. So, but if it's a question of, on the one hand, respectability and losing respectability, and on the other hand, it doesn't seem like it's a host it's like a hospitable environment if people don't want you there. And then, don't you find it interesting? I love this. sex. We've got to talk about sex for a minute, Jill. <laughs> sex would have been a good topic. Um, isn't it interesting that heterosexuality was policed? That they were worried about men getting it on with women and there were all these men together at the bar? I find that fascinating. <laughs> fascinating. In our own day, everybody's afraid of the gays. Why weren't they afraid of the gays? I just think that it's so interesting to me that what, that's the difference. What becomes a concern? Why is it a concern? May not necessarily reflect what's going on, but larger social processes that aren't always um, obvious. Anyway, I would like to go back there and, yeah, drink with them. That's why I was hoping for a time machine. <laughs> Please email me, Gisatara at UVic. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. I don't know how to follow that up. She even asked for a round of applause to thank the speaker. I, I have nothing left to say. <laughs> I thought that was a fabulous talk. Thank you so much, Georgia. It was wonderful. Um, and perhaps we will do sex next year. I think that sounds great. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. Um, well, I wish you all a happy and safe holiday season. Please drink responsibly. All right. <laughs> think back to the history you've learned when you uh, when you reflect on the labels on your uh, on your liquor bottles as you buy them and uh, or as you uh, decide not to imbibe. And uh, and thank you again for coming tonight. This was a great uh, a great audience and lots of great questions. And we'll see you in February. Okay. I, I would Good like night. to make one more remark. Hold on. Can I make one more remark? Of course you can. So Jill asked me to talk about uh, alcohol in everyday life, and it made me think that. Alcohol, actually, for most of us, is about leisure, but for a lot of people, the bar and the tavern is a source of work. So a reminder about leisure, and a reminder about labor. And uh, my dad is a Greek folk musician. He played Greek music for Montreal Greek expats in bars for 30 years. And so the, har the, the bar helped to raise me. And so I think about, when we think about the bar, we can't only think about it as a place of leisure. We have to also think about it as a place of work. And thinking about it in terms of labor studies, in terms of work, might actually change how we think about it in a more complex way. Thank you so that's much, a really, everyone. That's fantastic.